SpaceX have crashed a Falcon 9 into a bridge. Is the damage really that bad? The UK's first orbital launch has just gotten a little bit closer and China's space station is about to get bigger. This is Monday's Tomorrow Space News. I was talking last week about the new deal with Roscosmos to fly a Russian cosmonaut on SpaceX's Crew-5 mission to the ISS, which was fantastic news. However, the mission has just been pushed by a few weeks following damage to the brand new booster in transport. There currently isn't any imagery which has been leaked so we can't show you the damage, however we are being told that the damage done is just a scratched interstage which should be easily repairable. This is a rough visualisation that I've made to try and explain how it probably happened but this is just based off what I've been told and some imaginative speculation. The launch date has only shifted from an early September date to a late September date which in the grand scheme of things isn't a lot of time. Ironically this incident also took place near Blue Origin's launch facility in Texas although obviously the incident is completely unrelated. Sticking to Texas, the last seven days have been busy for Ship 24. It's been performing several spin prime tests, which is when the turbo pumps of the engine, or engines, are spun up without an actual ignition. Well, an ignition isn't planned after what happened to Booster 7. The first test of this week took place on Monday, which was followed by this first test on Wednesday, this second test on Wednesday, this first test on Thursday where just one engine was tested and then this second test on Thursday where two engines were tested. Ship 25's payload bay section has been rolled out of Tent 3 showing that the construction of this ship is still progressing whilst its sibling has been testing out on the suborbital pad. The liquid oxygen tank section of Ship 25 has also been rolling with it ending up in the high bay. Time to talk about the boosters. Well, B7 has been stuck in high bay 2 for engine inspections, so B7.1 will have to make do. It's been testing near the orbital pad, with it being filled up with cryogenic liquid nitrogen and then having the big ropes pull down, simulating the different aerodynamic loads experienced by a vehicle during flight. A couple of days later, B7.1 was tested again when we heard a pop. What is probably Booster 10's aft sleeve has been flipped over in preparation for the dome inside to be fitted, which happened just a short while later. Oh look, we've had another Raptor delivery. Well, actually no. Although it may look like that, this is one of three Raptors which have been removed from the underside of Booster 7 and taken into Tent 1, presumably for better inspections. We have actually had some new Raptors delivered over the past week. Here you can see them being rolled in on a forklift, only a short while later, however, some older Raptors were taken away, most likely because of Booster 7's boom. Remember this random building that was being constructed near the SPMT yard only a few weeks ago? Well, we think we may have found its purpose. The Starlink V2 satellite loader was rolled into there on Tuesday, meaning it could be a Starlink clean room. Let me know what you think in the comments. Star Factory has also seen some progress, with siding covering a significant portion of the building now. Following B7's boom, the legs of the orbital launch mount were charred and a team has been spotted stripping paint off the legs as well. This is so a new coat can be applied just to tidy the place up a bit. Virgin Orbit and Spaceport Cornwall have submitted their assessment of environmental effects as they're getting ready for the first launch to orbit ever from UK soil. The assessment is somewhat comparable to the environmental assessment SpaceX had to fulfil for Starship operations in Boca Chica. The Civil Aviation Authority, who deal with aviation and spaceflight regulations here in the UK, have launched a public consultation where anyone can provide their views on the assessment that Virgin and Spaceport Cornwall have created. If you want to read through the 158 page PDF document that is readily available at the link in the description but the synopsis on the consultation webpage should be good enough for most of us. That states that Virgin Orbit are planning to perform two launches a year from Spaceport Cornwall until the year 2030. It's only two but it's a lot better than zero which it has been since the beginning of time for the United Kingdom. Whilst Virgin Orbit need an operator license, Spaceport Cornwall need a spaceport license and both are required for this launch agreement to work. 
Don't let the name trick you though, this isn't a brand new facility. Cornwall Airport Newquay has been around since the 1930s in different guises, starting off as a civilian airfield before being acquired by the RAF when World War II broke out. You can currently fly into here as a paying passenger with airlines such as Aer Lingus, British Airways, EasyJet, Eurowings and Logan Air all flying here from various European destinations. Soon however, low Earth orbit may just be on the departure screens whilst you're waiting in the terminal. Step aside SpaceX and Blue Origin, there's another rocket in town that can propulsively land itself. It is slightly smaller, but it's still really exciting nonetheless. Joe Barnard, founder of BPS Space, has been working towards this goal since 2015 and he's finally been able to stick the landing, learning the required skills along the way. It's a fantastic example that you can do anything if you put your mind to it and it's a massive goal accomplished. We'll be talking about this developing story more over the coming weeks as the footage is yet to be released to the public. What we do have footage of, however, are the launches from the past week, which we'll take a look at in space traffic. We're back to Vandenberg for another Starlink launch, this being the second mission of Shell 3. Lifting off at 1739 UTC on July 22nd, the booster supporting this mission was B1071. Liftoff marked the fastest turnaround time of Slick 4 East ever, halving the previous record of 22 days to 11 days, 16 hours and 0 minutes. After sending the second stage on its way to deliver the 46 satellites to their initial 338 by 232 kilometer 97.66 degree orbit, B1071 touched down on Of Course I Still Love You. This flight beat the record set last year for the most SpaceX flights within a year, being the 32nd only halfway through July. Next up, we have the flight of a brand new space station segment called Wenchen. This is the first of two laboratory modules and it's the first expansion of the modular station since the core module, Tyane, launched last year. Being a massive payload weighing in at 22.5 metric tons, it needed a massive rocket, which is why the Long March 5B was chosen for this mission. It launched at 0620 UTC on the 24th of July from Launch Complex 1 at the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on Henan Island in China. I'd keep looking up over the next few days though, as just like with Tiane, China has left the 21 ton Long March 5B stage in orbit and they've not actively deorbited it. Trust me when I say it won't make a good lawn ornament. The same day at 1338 UTC, Falcon 9B1062 launched from LC-39A for the Starlink Group 425 mission. On board were 53 Starlink satellites which have been delivered to their initial 338 by 232 km 53.22 degree low Earth orbit. Expectedly, the booster successfully touched down on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas, marking the 33rd SpaceX flight of the year so far. These styling flights can get a bit repetitive sometimes, but it's always nice to have some insane records being shattered. Wenshin has not only departed Earth, it's also arrived at station, docking to the forward port on the Tyane core module at 1913 UTC, also on July 24th. It'll soon be moved over to the left-hand side port by a robotic arm. It's a rare week this week, it's going to be quiet. The only launch is scheduled at the maiden flight of Landspace's Zuke 2, gunning to be the first methane powered rocket into orbit, and Antipodean Adventure on an electron from here. As we get into August, however, things should get a little more exciting. Tomorrow wouldn't be possible without these people on your screen, the citizens of tomorrow who contribute financially to the show. The different tiers provide different perks ranging from seeing space news scripts as they're being written, exclusive discord channels and everyone gets access to the pre and post tomorrow live hangouts. At the extreme top of the list we have Neurostream who gets access to our internal Office 365 backend in return for their incredible support. If you want to join head to youtube.com forward slash tmro forward slash join or click the join button below. It's the end of this episode of the news but make sure you keep your eyes peeled on the Tomorrow channel as space weather will hopefully be coming your way sometime this week. Due to the unavailability of Jamie and Dutta there will be no live show this week but I'll be back next Monday with another week of updates. That's all for now, thank you for watching and goodbye.